So today I want to talk about <coughs> the verses in the Qur'an regarding marriage and particularly the, those three verses the Prophet used to use for doing the nikah. But in those three verses the Prophet used to do doing nikah, the last one <coughs> is the one that I really want to focus on today. So I will start with the last verse. And then after that, I will, if we have time, then I'll go to the other verses also. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayuhal ladheena amanu, O you people who believe, qulu qawlan sadeeda. O you people who believe, say the straight word. Say it. Don't hide behind the bushes. Say it straight. So what does this mean? And what does this have to do with marriage? Of course, in any relationship, you should be truthful. But uh, obviously this is no, not true in any, more relation, in any relationship more than it's true in marriage. Because every relationship, particularly marriage, is built upon trust. But these words of Allah, Ya ayuhal ladheena amanu qulu qawlan sadeeda are actually much deeper than just being truthful for the sake of trustworthiness. For me to demonstrate this, I'm going to give you some examples of what happens. You know, when a relationship is good, you can look in, the, in your spouse's wife in her eyes, or you can make a certain gesture, and just by that gesture, just by looking into her eyes, a certain message can be given to her that's understood between you and her, like a secret code. And when the relationship is not good, then those same types of gestures are sending all types of wrong signals. I'm going to talk about this in a second. What happens in a relationship is, in the beginning, when you have no positive feelings or negative, meaning when, when she's a good person, you're a good person, right? Like uh, I give this example of uh, Zayd and Zainab. Zayd radiallahu an and Zainab radiallahu anha. They were two good people, but they got a divorce. And so did many companions of the Prophet How does it happen that two good people, they end up with a divorce? How do two good people end up in a situation where they have antagonistic feelings towards one another? How does this process work? And how does it relate to this particular verse of the Qur'an, Ya ladina amanu qulu qawlan sadida. Yuslih lakum a'malakum. Oh, you people who believe, say the true word, say the straight word, and Allah will make your affairs correct. And this is actually the miraculous part of it because Allah says if you're truthful in the sense that you need to be truthful, which I'll talk about in a second, Yuslih lakum a'malakum. Allah will fix your affairs, Allah will make it right. So I'm going to demonstrate what I'm trying to say with a few examples. Let's say there's a wife. She's at home. The children, they got sick. They have smallpox. The husband's a doctor. He's at a conference. He's, let's say, in California, and she lives in New Jersey or somewhere in this area on the East Coast. She calls her husband to tell him the children are sick. So there's language, but then there's the meta-language. What is the meaning behind the language? So she tells her, calls her husband, says the children are sick. What she's expecting... What she's expecting is for him to say, oh, should I come home to help you take care of the kids? But because he's a doctor and he doesn't see smallpox as a, as a big deal, it's no big deal, it's a smallpox. Every kid goes through it, right? Uh, or many kids go through it. So he doesn't offer her, hey, you want me to come home and help you take care of the kids? So she shuts the phone and because she had a certain expectation, she starts telling herself, see, he doesn't care for me. See, I just proved to myself he doesn't care for me. Then if she's really upset, she might call him back and say, hey, why didn't you? And then she'll be angry and then he'll be angry and then, you know, it builds up from there. Another example of a meta language, you're talking, but what is being said behind the sentences sometimes have a bigger meaning than the words themselves. So uh, let's say there's a husband and wife. And uh, the husband already had a prearranged appointment. He had an, an appointment to be with his son. 
his, uh, no, his, with his friend. He has to go somewhere with his friend. The wife, something came up for her, and her son needs to be at the soccer game, and she usually takes her son to the soccer game. She asks her husband, can you take our son to the soccer game and forget about your appointment? It's just a small thing I'm asking you. And he's, he feels, so how do they both feel? He feels that I have to give in. She feels I have to give in. And she has, oh, he can't even let go of this small thing for me. And he may feel she's always making big demands. And there's the language behind the language is what I'm trying to say. Maybe a simpler way of explaining this is if she's putting up a picture uh, by herself. She's about to hammer, hammer the picture into the wall. The husband says, let me help you. She says to herself, see, he doesn't... He, can't, he thinks I can't even put up a picture, right? So there's the language, and then there is the meta-language behind the language that takes place. The problems in marriage take place at, not at the level of language, but at the level of meta-language. What you think the other person is thinking. What you think what the other person is thinking. This is where the problem occurs. And in that, particularly in marriage, it has to do with... The, lang the meta language is, does he accept me or does he reject me? Does he care for me or does he not care for me? Right? The meta language is, a wife asks you to do something, you say yes or no, and she takes that as, see, he accepts me or see, he rejects me. That's the meta language. That's the, meta -la the language behind the meta language behind the language that takes place. And this is why it's important to remember that if there are two good people, how come this negativity comes in where we start translating? Because in the beginning when you don't know each other, you don't have experience with each other, there's, the fears haven't been built up yet. So when you do something, there's positive feelings in the beginning. There's no history to do anything otherwise. But as history goes along, you, for, you tend to, and this is another big problem, is that people tend to blame the spouses. So he thinks that she's the problem the marriage is not working. She thinks he's the problem, the marriage is not working. Whereas what is not working is, is that he's a good person and she's a good person, but what's not working is the marriage. There's a communication gap, like in the, in the specific instances that I'm giving. There's a communication gap and that's hurting the ma marriage. Not that she's bad or not that he's bad. This is why, you know, the Quran says in the Ba'da, many of the thoughts that you think they're sins because when you start on this negative path right then you start translating everything he is doing or everything she is doing as a form of rejection or a form of acceptance so it's very important that you your level of conversation is where you're not trying to mind read what the other person is trying to say and uh, and to actually come out and to say what you're feeling if you have fears, you know, and what is more truthful than being vulnerable? What's more truthful than being vulnerable? To say, this is my fear. I fear you said no because you don't care about us, right? To have that conversation. Ya amanu If you say the true word, your affairs will be made right, right? And always when two people are good, you know she's good, you know he's good, and if negative thoughts are coming into your mind, then you have to know that something else is going on. If, and, and we know from the sayings of the Prophet wasallam that one of the, you know, that the shura had, had the, the, the shaitan has his majlis of shura, his, you know, his, his clonies come to him and tell him, I did this, 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 and one of them says, I broke a uh, husband and wife, and then this is what makes him happy, right? And how does that happen? Two good people getting separated apart from each other happens because the language, even though it may have been pretty much normal, but the meta-language, what was being understood behind that language was something negative, something different. I'll give you a very simple example of that. Um, you're at a dinner table, and uh, the doctor told the husband, don't, you know, uh, take care of your cholesterol or whatever it is and uh, he, he's looking at the menu and he says I'll have a steak for example and then she says oh you're gonna have a steak that's all she said you're gonna have a steak right but what does he read from that remark oh you're trying to control what I eat right or you're trying to use 
that diagnosis of the doctor to control me. Whatever it is, this is just a simple example. But the point is that there's language and then there's meta language. And you're never really truthful until you get down to the meta language. Until you get down, because you, you're not truthful unless you're saying what you're thinking. Right? Unless you're saying what you're thinking, you're not, it's not qulu qawl and sadida. You're beating around the bush. Right? And so it's important to have those conversations with your spouses where, you're, where you have those negative thoughts and you bring them up. Did you do this for this reason? What was the reason you did this? And then she or he may give an explanation which would most likely, if they're good people, most likely resolve that issue. Yes, if things escalate, then that's a different issue. Now, the other thing that I want to uh, talk about um, I was told by the camera brother not to use the word, I don't have time, but <laughs> it's kind of like a habit at this point. Um, so uh, another thing that happens in a relationship that you'll find very interesting, I'm going to share this with you, very interesting. This level of meta, meta language communication, you know where it breaks down? It breaks down on the word should. And. Uh, what you will find interesting is, uh, I was talking about this the other day, there's a saying of the Prophet uh, The Prophet says, don't say, Lo kana kada wa kada. Like, don't say, if this had happened or if this had happened. Okay? Don't say, if this would have happened or that would have happened. Throughout Islamic history, that saying of the Prophet وسلم, the shar, the explanation of that hadith, is that whatever Allah has destined will happen. So don't say if this happened or that happened. Allah has already destined for something to happen. It's going to happen because this is what Allah has destined. What you'll find interesting is, uh, inshallah, I'll complete this in my second khutbah uh, about the tyranny of the should. إن الحمد لله نحمده نستعينه ونستغفره ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أرسله بالحق بشيرا ونذيرا بين يدي الساء من يتع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وأهل الأقدة من لسان يفكه قول آمين يا رب so, the tyranny of the should is, is that generally when we interact with our spouses, or for that matter anybody, we have this should, we have this expectation. This person should do X, Y, Z. This guy should do, this husband should do this X, Y, Z. When this should... Now, uh, what's interesting is Karen Horning, uh, she wrote a book, she wrote one of the primary books on the subject of narcissism. Who's a narcissistic personality? And one of the chapters is called The Tyranny of Should. And the more narcissistic you are, the more shoulds you have in your meta language. He should have done this, and he should have done that, and she should have done this, and she should have done that. And that should turns into a double should. Because she should have done this, Therefore, I should do this to hurt her. Right? Do you get it? Because she should have done this, and because they didn't do what they were supposed to do, therefore, I should do. It becomes a double should. And in that sense, the saying of the Prophet ﷺ, don't say if such and such would have happened, or if such and such would have happened. Of course, as the Islamic theologians have explained, it has to do with the idea of qada and qadr, that you are in complete submission to whatever Allah's qadr is, but at the same time, what's interesting about that attitude is that you have to always be careful of your shoulds, your expectations, right? Sometimes a, a wife expects something from her husband, but the husband doesn't know she's expecting that. And then that leads her to believe that he's not accepting of me or accepting of us. And it adds up little by little and leads to sometimes devastating... Well, what will happen first is it'll be a double should. Because he's not doing this, I'm not going to give him time anymore. Because he's not doing what he should do, therefore I should react 
in this way. In the same way, the husband will be because she's not doing this, therefore I should do this. And so you have to be looking at your mind and thinking in your mind, where are you? Because one of the important discussions a husband and wife should have is the discussion of what are your expectations in any given situation. Because you have to take those situations where you saw the negativity come into your mind, you saw the negativity come into your mind, and then you have to have that conversation. And you have to come to a, a conclusion about what your expectations from each other were. What were you expecting me to do? And a lot of times people, because of the way that they were raised, you know, uh, maybe some parents leave their kids in, independent. And so they handle things in a different way. Other parents are more possessive and they help uh, their children through every single step. And so this, the way we were raised, our experiences make us think that the way I'm thinking is the only way things are sometimes, right? We all think that the way I think is the normal way. But another person, the way they're raised, their upbringing, their experiences, their traumas, their depression, changes the way that they are thinking. And they may not be thinking the way you're thinking. And a lot of times what happens is when two people get close, we think that we can uh, mind read our spouse or the, or the spouse may expect that he can mind, he, he should know, again, this is another big should, he should know what I need, right? And that is not always necessarily true. Now, the other thing that I wanted to uh, go into after, after this is a few things. Number one, there is a difference between how guys and girls communicate. And uh, like the Quran says, لَيْثَ ذَكَرُكَ unsa. A man is not like the woman. Her hormones are different. Her brain is different. The, the, the hormones in her brain are different. Her thyroid ha hormones are different. So she, she thinks differently than he does. And this is a well-established uh, phenomenon. This is, this is like beyond even... It's an outdated discussion to, to think that guys and girls have similar thought patterns. It's not true. And one of the differences is that, you know, girls in a relationship, for example, tend to ask more questions. For example, girls tend to ask more questions. Uh, so, what is... Now, when somebody asks you a question, you can take that in many different ways. One of the ways you can take, oh, she's asking me a question, therefore she's trying to dominate. She's trying to dominate. She's trying to ask about my credibility. She's trying to dominate me. She, she's asking too many questions. Another way girls tend to communicate is, you know, they'll say things sometimes like, do you want this? But what it, the meta language is, I want. Do you want ice cream? Meaning, I want ice cream, right? And so this is there. And so it's almost like we complement each other, but at the same time, that complementary nature, uh, if we're not careful, sets up sets us up to miscommunicate and have negative thought patterns. Another example I'll share with you, for example, is the way the reasons guys and girls say okay or yes, mm hmm you know? Girls say okay, okay, they're listening to a conversation, okay, okay, okay. They don't say, g girls say it just to say I'm listening to you. Oh, okay, okay. Not that I agree with you, by the way, guys. If your wife says acha, 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 acha. Okay, okay, okay. Doesn't mean she's agreeing with you. The guy is thinking she's agreeing with her. She, he, she's not. She's only telling him that I'm listening to what you're saying. Generally, when guys will say a cha cha cha, unless they're tuning her out, unless they're what, tuning her out. If a guy says yes, 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 he's saying it based upon yes, I agree with you, I agree with you, I agree with you. And then if he disagrees with her, then he'll disagree with her. But girls. Uh, give symbols and gestures uh, of like, okay, uh-huh, uh, to, to continue the conversation because it's, in their, it's, it's part of their, their nature to want the bonding of language, the bonding with language is a big part of their emotional makeup. And so those are some things that you have to be careful about. And this, you know, these are things that, uh, that are like, for example, asking a question and if the person's going to take it negatively, is he, are they asking for information or are they asking to challenge my authority? Th these, are, these are things that can go across, gen both genders will do, uh, do this, but girls do tend to ask more questions. And so 
uh, the other thing that I wanted to bring up was that, so how do you practically do this? And over here, I want to share with you something very important. One of the words used in Quran for Quran uh, is mubin, Quranun mubin, clear, unambiguous, self-evident, right? The word bayinat also, clear, clear evidence, but mubin means self-evident. Balahu mubin, to convey something absolutely clearly, right? There's no language barrier. It was conveyed absolutely con clearly what Allah was intending. And in fact, if you look at this, this is actually a great miracle of Islam. Uh, let's see. Uh, I have three minutes. Okay, let me say this quickly. I'll share with you a, a miracle uh, that I think is quite fabulous. Is that no religion has been able to communicate to its adherents, to the people that follow that religion. No religion has been able to communicate as much information as Islam has, as the Prophet has, as the Prophet communicated. You know, he was the communicator. The, even the word Rasul means he's a messenger. He's coming there. But he's Rasulun Mubin. He's a clear messenger. Balaghun Mubin. You know, Balligh, right? Balligh or Da'a. Da'a means Da'wa. Da'wa, like calling people, right? And Balligh to convey. Qawlan Balligha, a word that reaches your heart, right? So the prophets were able to convey the message of Islam in a way that it was understood by the masses of that time, and then they were able to convey it to the others. But no religion has conveyed such vast information where a person is saying, literally everything I'm doing, if I'm sitting, if I'm standing, if I'm talking, if I'm walking, what I'm dressing, what I'm wearing, what I'm eating, everything needs to be absorbed into that, into the, to the followers of that religion. And then they were able to convey that to the other people. What I'm trying to demonstrate from here is that not only is it miraculous how much information, like everything from, you know, there's, even in Christianity, I don't know if you know this, in Christianity, in Judaism, in other religions, you know, they pray differently in the different sects. They don't pray the same way. Even something as simple as salah, right? Something as prayer. You have different, same religion, but people are praying in a different way. Somebody is sitting on his knee, Somebody is doing the cross thing. Somebody is doing, you know, with their hands like this. Somebody is kneeling. Somebody is, somebody is, some Christians, what they do is they lay down on the floor completely with their hands stretched out, if you've ever seen that. Praying in different ways. But Islam was a religion of communication. Islam was a religion of balagh, a religion that clearly conveyed its message. And, and what's amazing about that is that to do that, it's, it goes back to the same verse. Ya amanu qulu qawlan sadida. Oh, you people who believe, say the true word, Allah will make your affairs right. And the Prophet in his communication wasn't only sensitive to what was going to happen today, but he was sensitive to what I say today, how it will be taken tomorrow, a century from now. Anyway, the point I'm trying to say is that your communication with your wife should not have assumptions, should not have negative thinking and if the negative thinking is there you need to sit down with her and have that conversation especially in what I call the tyranny of the shoulds. You should have done this and you should have done that. You should have mailed the letter. You should have paid the bill. You should have given me this allowance. Whatever it is, those shoulds that we don't talk about that are part of the meta language, right? That's what makes a leak in the marriage. And the other thing I wanted to talk about in a marriage generally what happens is you start blaming the spouse. This is the last point I'll say and then we'll pray inshallah. Like it's her fault and she'll think it's his fault. But if there's a leak in the sink, you don't say his fault or her fault. You say the problem is with the leak in the sink. Try not to ever think the problem is her or the problem is him. The problem is the marriage. The marriage is a third entity that is greater than you and her. The problem is not the wife. The problem is not the husband. The problem is... The, the marriage itself, something in the marriage, especially if he knows she's a good girl, 
and he and, and the wife knows he's a good guy and and then there's problems then the problem is not him or her but the problem is what I talked about the meta language that's taking place something is being said but then said in a way that is being translated in a negative way and this is why the, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran says in the that may, some of the negative thoughts you have are sins because they're they shouldn't be there Right there. This is why a mu'min should be somebody who's trying to. You know, the, there's a hadith. Of course, I have to explain this a little bit. But of course, the Prophet said no. But he never said no personally. For example, if the Prophet says, "La yu'minu ahadakum hatta uh, hatta hatta hawa tabam bima jaytu." None of you is a true believer until his desires are suppressed to what I brought. He said the word no, but it had to do with the deen. But in his personal relationships, there's a narration. The Prophet never said no. Because he always took things from a positive way. You know, the Quran <coughs> says, <coughs> Kalimatin tayyibatin. Kalimatin tayyibatin. A kalima, a word, tayyibatin, pure, right? Pure thoughts. Change your negative thinking about your spouse into positive. Because the problem is not necessarily her, the problem is the communication that, and the expectations you two have from each other. So, Kalimatin tayyibatin, kashajaratin tayyibatin. A pure, good word. A good word is like a pure tree. Asluha thabit. Asluha thabitun. Its roots are firmly in the ground. Wa farruha fis sama. And its branches are in the sky, which is where the fruits come from. So, if you have positive thinking and you challenge the negative thinking you have about your spouse, and then beyond that, look at what are the shoulds in your meta, meta language, and then have that discussion before you go to sleep. Right? And I want to end here with. Uh, a hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam there was a man he came into the masjid and the Prophet said this man is going to Jannah this man is going to Jannah one of the companions thought oh this man's going to Jannah I should see what he does so he went to him and said I want to be your guest so he, he stayed in his house for three days after the three days he couldn't get it the Prophet said, this man goes to Jannah. And, and so he asked him, he said, I was with you for three days. The Prophet said these words about you, that you're going to Jannah. You didn't do any extra prayers. You didn't do any extra, you didn't do any nawafib. You didn't do anything extra. What is it that you do? He said, I don't do anything extra. I don't do anything special. But he said, there's one thing. I don't go to sleep without forgiving everyone for that day. I don't go to sleep without forgiving everyone for that day. And of course, the nearer someone it is, is to you, the more problems they're going to make for you, right? So, go to sleep, forgive your... So have that conversation where it's easy for you to forgive your wife. Or have that conversation where it's easy for you to forgive your husband. Because if you don't have that conversation, it's going to... It's those negative thoughts in Naba'd al-Dhanni Ismun become... Manifest, they start festering in your mind and it becomes harder to do what? It becomes harder to say the truthful word because then she doesn't want to tell him the truth because she's like, oh, he'll think he's bigger than me. Right? If she says, I'm hurt, like a lot of times, this happens to me in uh, counseling all the time. I want to tell the husband how, or, or whoever, I want to tell the husband how much he hurt her by what he did. But she's telling me, don't tell him. Because, why? Because then he'll think he won. Don't tell him because he think, he'll think that he won. And you want to you you display my pain laughing at me. That's how it begins to manifest, the negativity. And so it's hard to sometimes say the true word or to be truthful or to be direct in what you're feeling because you, you're thinking, oh, if I tell him what will, you know, she, she think or what will he think and so what are what are another aspect that I just want to finish with and then inshallah we'll pray right now um, about the negative thoughts what, 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 one I asked about the should right but there's two more that are very important la khawfun alayhim wa la hum is your fears your fears what are your fears she will do or he will do what what is your fear what is your fear and uh, okay, we'll just leave it at that. Fears, a lot of times when people talk to us and we have fears, like let's say the wife has a fear, he's going to cancel my credit card, right? That's just a fear. He's not going to do that. But she fears that he's going to do that. So what happens is that fear creates that negativity, 
right? So there's the tyranny of the should and the tyranny of the double should. And then there's the fears that we have from each other that because we're close, how we can hurt each other. And so we need to have that conversation where every day, if you take one, one event, because once you solve that one event, that solves a hundred events, right? Because they're the same type of events repeat themselves. So every day, if you talk about one event that I was thinking this, what were you thinking? Why did you think this? You know, at the level of vulnerability, at the level of what were your fears? What were your regrets, right? What made you sad? And the, uh, with the fear is huzn, which is what made you sad? What did I do that hurt you? Or what did you, uh, I, you do that hurt me? Right? If you can have that level of conversation where you can express your fears and your sadness and your expectations, then inshallah the marriage can go uh, at a very deep, deep level. And over here, I'll end with, you know, what's the biggest thing a woman wants in her relationship? The biggest thing uh, a woman wants in her relationship is to feel understood. My husband understands me. And you'll never understand her unless you have those deeper conversations of what are your fears? What were your expectations? What, what is it that I did that hurt you? Until you don't have that conversation, she won't feel understood. And at the same time, what is the biggest need of a man? The biggest need of a man is to feel respected. More than love. If a guy is given a choice, she will love you, but she won't respect you. And another girl, she's going to respect you, but she may not love you as much. A guy will always choose the one that's going to treat him, that he feels is treating me right. Right? He wants that respect. And that respect won't happen, again, if there's all this negative communication going on, he's not going to feel respected. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help uh, our marriages. رَبَّنَا حَبْلَنَا مِنَ أَزْوَاجِنَا وَذُرِيَاتِنَا كُرَّةَ عَيُنْ وَجَعَلْنَا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ إِمَامَا رَبَّنَا حَبْلَنَا مِنَ أَزْوَاجِنَا وَذُرِيَاتِنَا كُرَّةَ عَيُنْ وَجَعَلْنَا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ إِمَامَا In Islam, our sense of entertainment is the time we, you know, قُرَّةَ عَيُنْ رَبَّنَا حَبْلَنَا مِنَ أَزْوَاجِنَا وَذُرِيَاتِنَا كُرَّةَ عَيُنْ Wallah, make our wives and our children the apple of our eye. This is entertainment. This is the, you know, spending time with your son and your children and your wife. It shouldn't be the house is a place of negativity and, and, and all that negativity festering. You've got to have those conversations.